What a lovely scene as I'm stood here this morning introducing our online Sunday service at Ridgeway Community Church, Redditch. Beautiful sunshine and a lovely crop of grain growing, soon to be harvested. Reminds me of what Jesus said. He said, I am the bread of life. Well, we're going to feed our souls this morning as we worship together and especially around the word of God. We will also be breaking bread together. We have as our guest preacher this morning, Gordon Robbins from Welcome Hall Evangelical Church in Cats Hill. So let's begin with this lovely song of praise as we join together in worship. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to our little child. Let's pray, shall we? Come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we are afforded this morning to come together. And we have come to worship, we have come to pray and sing your praises and hear your word as part of our worship this morning. And it is fitting that we should do so, fitting that we should call upon you, fitting that we should praise you, fitting that we should hear your voice and learn of you. For if we did not do so, the very stones would cry out in praise to our God and our Saviour. Father, I pray that you would just move our hearts by your Holy Spirit. And if there be any hardness or reluctance, that it would melt away as we consider the wonder of who you are in all your glory. Father, open our eyes this morning that we may see Jesus and the beauty of our Saviour. Lord, come to us this morning, we pray. And as we break bread together, oh Lord, will you make that so meaningful, lest, Lord, we pass it by as something irrelevant to us. Or we become indifferent to such a thing when such a thing as the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup is a proclamation 
of your atoning death, Lord Jesus, for us on Calvary's cross and points to your return one day when you will come again in glory and in power. So help us, we pray. Draw alongside us this morning. Grant, Lord, that even the the heat in the stillness should not be a distraction to us, but rather we should not only in our souls be be refreshed, but yet also in our bodies. Lord, touch us, we pray, and grant that Jesus Christ will be lifted up, not only here, but Lord, in all those places where your people gather across the land in the name of Jesus to praise you, to lift up your name. Draw near to them and to us, to those who listen online to the recording of our service later today or in the week. Father, to those especially who are unable to be with us for all sorts of circumstances that have come upon them. Will you strengthen the weak? Will you lift up the downcast? Will you minister to them according to their need? In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.
I think that the breaking of bread is always a lovely opportunity for us to kind of refocus and remind ourselves of the wonder of the love of God in Christ Jesus, that he loved us and gave himself for us. And the reality of that should not only stir our hearts to thanksgiving and worship, but when the Lord Jesus instituted the communion service, the breaking of bread, and he said to his disciples that you do this in remembrance of me and spoke of the bread as representing his broken body and the, blood, the cup that they drank then representing his shed blood. And if you move forward a couple of decades from the crucifixion of Jesus and you enter the church in the European city of Corinth, in that setting there was a great deal of thoughtlessness and tension within the congregation even around the breaking of bread. And there's a, there's a little phrase in 1 Corinthians 11 where the Apostle Paul, he wants to set in order and he urges the Christians there that they should examine themselves lest they are not discerning the Lord's body. They need to come in a worthy manner. Now I know, of course, fundamentally that the breaking of bread, the communion service, is, is that powerful, visible reminder of the nature of our redemption, that it is founded and rooted in what Jesus Christ has, has done. But I think that coming in a worthy manner means that our own attitudes as Christians to others are significant and important. And we are told to examine ourselves and then partake of the bread and of the cup. It'll be a challenge to me. How easy it is, is to slip into a kind of careless mode where we are, we're almost comfortable with perhaps being grating in our attitude towards others, not loving them as we, as we should. And in a, in a few moments, Hans and Lisa are going to sing a duet, and I believe that song focuses, doesn't it, on love for one another and that's why I wanted to, to share in this way this morning I'm not suggesting that any of us have a problem in that way but I do see it as a, as a challenge a reminder to us to search our own hearts when we come around the Lord's table that we might partake in a worthy manner and if there is need in our own heart about our attitudes towards others then we need to say sorry, don't we, to the Lord. We need to own up. Those things should never be a barrier to us in the relationships you have with others because it says, let a man examine himself and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the wine. It only becomes a barrier and an issue if you will not own it that it's the case and ask the Lord's forgiveness and then intend in your own heart to seek to endeavour to mend those relationships and to be more loving in future. Sometimes we fall out with people, don't we? But it needs to be sorted out. So let's examine ourselves. I'm going to ask Gavin, first of all, if he would come and pray. And then perhaps if Hans and Lisa would just allow a minute of silence so we can search our hearts for a moment, then will you come forward and sing your duet? Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the bread and for the cup that's set before us this morning. Lord, we realise that uh, it was our forefather, Adam and Eve, that once rebelled against you. They were real historical people and they rebelled against you. And Lord, we all have this sin problem. But we thank you, Lord, that uh, you didn't leave us uh, to sort ourselves out but Lord you the creator stepped into your creation and you took upon yourself human flesh and that was broken upon the cross we thank you Lord that our creator became our saviour and uh, has redeemed us and rescued us from this sin problem and death problem that we all have thank you Lord that we can partake freely this morning 
and know that you have redeemed us, you've brought us back to yourself, and Lord, you've given us a promise of eternal life in a new creation where the old has gone and the new has come. So Father, we do examine ourselves this morning, and Lord, we confess our sins to you, that Lord, we are um, not worthy to partake. Lord, we are, we are sinners, and Lord, we confess that sin to you now. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that the blood of Christ, uh, which has been shed for us, uh, cleanses us from all sin, and that we are perfect before the Father. So, Lord, we just praise you and thank you this morning for the bread and for the wine, and we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bye. 
had given thanks, Jesus took the bread. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. deeply as you drink this cup this morning. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins for many.
just to let you know that Rosemary's father has died. He was 96 and over in South Africa. This means that Rosemary is looking to return to South Africa for the funeral. So I want to pray for Rosemary and the family this morning. Um, also that on Thursday afternoon I'll be conducting a funeral at Cookhill Baptist Church. Um, this is as a result of our involvement over a number of years with uh, a local family as they were local then to Cook Hill. So please remember uh, me in that occasion. People need comfort, don't they? But we need to uh, point them to the Lord Jesus as the Saviour. So let's just uh, come in prayer, shall we? Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the freedom we have just to come before you as we are. We thank you for the remembrance opportunity this morning in the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup. Thank you for the reality of that finished work of your beloved Son, our Saviour, on Calvary's cross. It is finished, he said. It is completed. It is done. Father, I pray that our faith will be in him. Help us, Lord, to see the truth of it and to respond to it this morning. We bless the word as it is preached to us in a little while. Help us, we pray, to be receptive to that which we hear this morning. Father, we especially want to pray for our dear sister, Rosemary. Father, you know how difficult it is to be such a long way from family. We thank you for her father's faith in Christ, so evident, so vibrant, even to the end. And we know that we can say that you've called him home to be with you. Pray, Lord, for Rosemary as her heart aches and that of her sister and the wider family, missing a loved one. Pray that she will be held firm by that wonderful hope in Jesus Christ, her hope, as indeed her father's hope. How different it is, Lord, with those who have no hope in Christ, Oh Lord, I pray that the fragrance of Jesus will be spread abroad in that funeral on Thursday afternoon at Cook Hill. Father, that hearts and minds will be touched, facing the reality of death, the loss of a beloved mother, grandmother. Yet Lord, to have hope in Jesus Christ is to bring stability and a deep, lasting comfort and peace. Father, we pray that in our land that your word would go out with great power in these days. Father, we would see a change in attitudes amongst those who are in positions of influence and authority, a change in attitude towards the word of God, your word, Father, in the midst of all the turmoil, the political turmoil of the selection of a new leader for the Conservative Party and therefore a new Prime Minister, O oh Lord, in your grace and your goodness, will you grant that such a one might be established as a leader and Prime Minister who loves light rather than darkness, who promotes righteousness rather than ungodliness, O oh Lord, will you raise up such a leader? 
We thank you that the king's heart is in your hand to turn whichsoever way you will, just like a watercourse. Father, I pray that we might see that in our own land in these days. And will you give to your church, will you grant to us a, a holy and wise and gracious and humble boldness to proclaim the truth of your word in every aspect of life. And Lord, will you add to your church others bringing salvation to many. Thank you, Lord, for the church in particular church in Scotland who are having a church holiday this week commencing this evening associated with Lydia and Alistair and family. Father, will you grant journeying mercies to those of the family and friends who are attending and those from the church? Will you give such power to the one who brings your word? And you know, Lord, there will be young people there who have wandered astray, whose hearts have been seized with an affection for the things and pleasures of this world, many of which are displeasing to you. O oh Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will brood over that gathering throughout the week. And Alistair, Lydia and others in the family and in the church will have something wonderful to rejoice. Even those returning to you like the prodigal returning to the Father. Those coming to faith experiencing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves, the one who, though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Thank you, Father, that we can come to you. Thank you that we know that you hear our prayers as we come in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture passage this morning is taken from Luke's Gospel and it is Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 and we're going to be reading uh, right the way through. So Luke chapter 15. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, 
and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for this son, my, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Amen.
Well, good morning everybody. Good morning. Nice to see you all. There's some faces I do recognise. Hi, hi. Uh, but plenty that I don't. So uh, nice to meet you for the first time. Obviously, uh, I meet with uh, Bill from time to time at uh, a pastor's fraternal. So uh, aware of what's uh, been going on here, but lovely to come and see it uh, in the flesh, so to speak. And a blessing to be with you and share fellowship with you. And uh, greetings to you from all at Welcome Hall. Uh, Bill said we're in Cats Hill, that's Bromsgrove. I guess we're fairly close, so most of you knew that. But like Cats Hill is the jewel in the Bromsgrove crown, for those that you don't know it. Yeah, so. Right, okay, so the, um, the telling of stories. Our culture is very into stories, isn't it? But our telling of stories, it's something that's been common uh, through cultures or through the generations. Uh, yes, yeah, so storytelling, common through all cultures down through the generations and the centuries. And stories are used for different purposes. Uh, they might be for entertaining, uh, they might be for passing on histories and traditions. And they are used to inspire and instruct and this, this morning we're going to be considering one of the instructional stories uh, known as the parables that Jesus told during his ministry on earth. Now parables often described as a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Uh, that's a story involving normal everyday events and characters that has a deeper spiritual meaning. And the one we're going to be particularly focusing on this morning is found in verses 11 through to 32 of chapter 15 that we've just read. Now Luke 15 can be described as the lost chapter of Luke. Uh, not because it's been missing uh, for ages and suddenly rediscovered, uh, like Beatrix Potter's the tale of Kitty in Boots, which apparently was lost for about a hundred years before it was rediscovered and then published in 2016. So Luke 15 hasn't been lost in that sense. It's lost because it deals with three parables, all of which are concerned with things that are lost. In verses four to seven, uh, we've got the parable of the lost sheep. Verses 8 to 10 have the parable of the lost coin. And in verses 11 through to 32, we've got the parable of the lost son. But why, you may be wondering, why did Jesus tell three parables, one after another, about things that were lost and subsequently found? Well, the central theme of these three parables gives us the answer. And this theme is really well described by the commentator William Hendrickson. He describes it as the father's yearning love for the lost. The father's yearning love for the lost. And I thought that was so good, I've used it as the title for the sermon. So the father's yearning love for the lost. And if we want to know why Jesus wanted to highlight uh, that yearning love, we just have to look at the first three verses of the chapter. Now, some parables that Jesus told were for a general audience. Uh, we're told the parable of the sower, you remember that one, was told to a large crowd. So it was a general parable. But others were more specifically targeted, like the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, Jesus told that to answer a specific question from an expert in the law. And we read that in Luke chapter 10. Now, as with that last example, the first three verses of chapter 15 show that these lost and found parables were also directed at a specific group of people, namely 
the Pharisees and the scribes. And Jesus told it to rebuke them for failing to love people as God did. Now the parables would certainly have been a great encouragement to the tax collectors and sinners who were also listening to them. And we read in verse 1 that they drew near to him, that's Jesus, to hear him. They would have been aware of the amazing miracles that Jesus has done and they wanted to hear what he had to say. And that's a great lesson for us, isn't it? That when we read our Bibles or come to church, we don't do so in a sort of mechanical, going through the motions sort of way, but that we draw near to worship, to hear what Jesus would say to us through his word as we listen, as we read with expectancy. But sadly, that's not the attitude we find described in verse 2, where we read that the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees and scribes weren't so concerned about hearing what Jesus had to say as much as about complaining and criticising him for eating with people they considered to be of bad reputation. The sort of people who no respectable religious leader would want to be associated with, let alone to eat with. And it's because of this hardness of heart that we then read in verse 3 that Jesus spoke this parable to them. And the them being specifically the complaining Pharisees and scribes. And he tells them these parables so that they might see the Father's yearning love for the lost and recognise how wrong their own attitude is. So Jesus starts with the parable of the lost sheep in verses 4 to 7. And there we see the shepherd going out looking for his lost sheep. And the lost sheep, of course, representing those tax collectors and sinners. And then rejoicing, as it were, to bring them home as they turn back to him in repentance. Next, Jesus tells them the parable of the lost coin in verses 8 to 10. The coin, again, representing the tax collectors and sinners, is found and we're told that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus had shown the Pharisees and scribes two examples of God's yearning love for the lost. And the joy that results when even one of them turns to him in repentance. And it's as if he's saying to the Pharisees and the scribes, Go and do likewise. Now we don't know whether the Pharisees and scribes actually got that message if they realised what Jesus uh, was saying to them at that stage, that he was calling them to change their attitude. But we do know from other parables that when Jesus included his opponents in the story, they realised and they understood and we see that in the parable of the tenants in Luke 20, where we read, The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him, that's Jesus, immediately, because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So that Jesus then goes on to tell the final parable in his a series of lost parables, the parable of the lost son. Or as we also know it, the parable of the prodigal son. And this time, he includes the Pharisees in the story. And as we look at the parable in more detail now, we're going to consider it from the perspective 
of the lost son, the loving father, and the unforgiving brother. So, the lost son. Uh, we're introduced to him in verses 11 and 12, uh, where we read, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And as we read that, I think we can see that the lost son was already lost even before he left home. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, it appears that this son had lost any sense of relationship, any connection with his father or his brother because he just wants to get his portion of goods and then leave home. Now, when he asks for his portion of goods, he isn't asking for some sort of financial help for a trip, a sort of first century gap year that he wants to go on. No, what he's asking for is actually his inheritance. Now, as I'm sure you know, the key thing about an inheritance is that in order to get it, the person who gives it has to have died. And so when this son asks for his inheritance, for his portion of the goods, what he's effectively saying to his father is, I wish you were dead. And the son then compounds his lostness by getting all his money together, casting off his family and journeying to a far country where we told he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Uh, prodigal meaning a person who spends money recklessly, extravagantly. And then after living like that for some time, it's no surprise that we read he had spent all. And sadly, then he finds a famine arrives in the land and he began to be in want. So as Leon Morris, the commentator, puts it, this son, he ran out of money and he ran into a famine. He'd left home to go to a place where he undoubtedly thought the grass was going to be greener. But now he found out that not only was it not greener, it was actually non-existent. He had no money, and from what we read in verses 15 and 16, he didn't appear to have any food either. And from then, he actually reaches rock bottom by going and taking a job feeding pigs. Now the son, obviously he was a Jew, and pigs were considered unclean animals uh, to the Jews. And we read that in Leviticus chapter 11. And there was even a saying uh, amongst the teachers at the time which said, may a curse come upon the man who cares for swine. May a curse come upon the man who cares for swine. So hungry and now humiliated and despised, this son reaches rock bottom. His lostness is complete. Now, I don't know about you, but I like those passages in the Bible where we find the word but. And it's in a really significant position. Like in Romans 6.23, where we read, For the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Or in John 3.16, where we read, Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we find one of these 
but in verse 17. Now they can be positive or negative, but this one again is a very positive one. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. The but had indicated a change in his attitude. He finally realised where the green grass really was. And he decided to go home. And as he approaches home, rather than finding his father there waiting to greet him with a harsh and a critical attitude, we're told his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son, whose humiliation had turned in humility, then says to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father welcomes him home and arranges a party to celebrate, because this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now as the tax collectors and sinners listen to this and hopefully recognise uh, that Jesus was using the parable to show God's yearning love for the lost, how encouraged they would have been to hear that someone like them, someone who had made bad choices, who had made mistakes, someone who was far from God, was still loved by God and could come back to him, responding in humility and repentance. Now, you may not be a tax collector here today, but you certainly are a sinner, as I am, as we all are. We, in fact, we've all been born with an attitude that turns against God that rebels against him and wants to live our own way, do our own thing without any reference to him, like the son in the parable. And so because of that, we find ourselves in almost a similar situation to the son with his father, estranged and in great trouble. But the good news is that if we return to God in humility and repentance, he will welcome us back, regardless of what we've done. Some people say, I could never come to God, you don't know what I've done. I say, it doesn't matter. Regardless of what you've done, if you come to God in repentance and humility, he will welcome you back just as the father in the parable welcomed back his lost son. Okay, so our second point, the loving father. Now I'll just uh, give you a little heads up here. The last two points aren't as long as the first one. Okay, so, so you can relax. Uh, you will be back in time for dinner. Okay, so let's look at things from the perspective of the loving father. Now, he must have been upset uh, by the actions of his youngest son, asking for his inheritance and then just rejecting him and leaving home. Now, I guess uh, many of us have done unkind things to our fathers uh, at one time or another. Uh, I remember the time many years ago uh, when my father was sitting in his chair at holding a mug of tea and looking, if he were, looking as if he was going to go to sleep. And I thought it would be interesting to see if he actually managed not to go to sleep and therefore not spill his drink on himself. Uh, sadly, he did go to sleep and he did spill his drink on himself. Now that's just a frivolous example of an unkind thing I did to my father. 
but you can see it's a completely different league to the way this son in the parable treated his father. But nevertheless, we see the great love of the father that he still is willing to provide his son with the inheritance he's requested. And no doubt in order to do that, selling things, reducing his estate to provide the money, no doubt at great cost and inconvenience to himself, he does so. And when the son leaves, he actually watches for his return. And when he eventually sees him, when he was still a great way off, he has compassion on him and rushes to embrace him and welcome him back. Now this parable focuses on God's yearning love for the lost. That's the particular thing about God that it highlights for us. And because it does that, it doesn't cover all that God has done uh, to make his plan of salvation possible. Possible for us to be forgiven and to return to him and be welcomed into his family. We're all sinners and sin has to be punished. God is a God of holiness and justice. So our sin has to be punished. And as we mentioned earlier, the wages of sin is death, which means that our sin will carry us to hell when we die, unless it's dealt with before. And the only way it can be dealt with before is through Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to earth and died on the cross, he was taking the punishment we deserve, the punishment for our sin. So that when we put our faith in Jesus, God sees him as having taken our punishment and we go free. We're forgiven and welcomed into God's family. And we receive the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is knowing him with us day by day, helping us, granting us his peace. And then finally going to be with him in heaven forever when we die. As the songwriter puts it, how deep the father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet to forgive your sin, let me encourage you to do that today. To trust him to forgive your sin. Don't carry it yourself. Don't carry it to the grave. Whatever you do, trust Jesus to forgive you and come into that life-changing relationship that only he can bring, peace with God and becoming part of God's family. And if you're a Christian here today and you feel perhaps you've drifted from God, things have come into your life, behaviours, habits, and you feel there's a barrier between you and God, you're not living as you should, don't worry Come back to him. The Apostle John tells us in his first letter that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ask him for his forgiveness. He is waiting to welcome you back. And finally, the unforgiving brother. Now he, the unforgiving brother, actually represents the Pharisees and the scribes in the parable. Now you would have thought that the older brother who'd stayed uh, with his father would, living with his father, learning those sort of attitudes that his father had, he would have shared his father's love for this lost son. But that just isn't the case. 
Instead, as we read in verse 26, he was angry and would not go in to the celebration feast. He doesn't share the father's compassion for the brother. He feels that because he's lived as he has in obedience and in a, a right way as he sees it, that he is righteous. He feels he's righteous compared to his brother. But no, the reality is he himself is self-righteous. He's a sinner who needs to be forgiven just as much as the younger brother. He needs to be forgiven because he's completely failed to show the real love that God has. And this behaviour was exactly the same as that of the Pharisees and the scribes that Jesus was telling the parable to. Because they followed all the outward regulations of the law, but in their hearts they neither loved God nor those who were lost and in need of compassion and help. They had no real understanding of God's heart. And so Jesus tells this parable to expose their wrong thinking and show them that they were also lost sinners. Lost sinners who needed to turn to God for forgiveness. They too needed to hear the words, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They needed to hear those words applied to them. So, if you're a Christian here today, let's make sure we are continually developing a heart of love for the lost. A heart that mirrors God's. A heart that looks at those who are far from God with love and compassion. Not as the Pharisees and scribes looked at the tax collectors and sinners as people unfit to associate with and if you're already developing this heart follow the encouragement that Paul gave to the Thessalonians and do so more and more so that we might truly reflect God's yearning love for the lost Amen
Let's pray then as we close. Father, we ask that you would help us to take your word to heart. Thank you for your magnificent, unmatched love. And we ask that we would ever desire to reach out to those around us and indeed to ourselves respond to your extended arms of love and welcome through Jesus Christ to turn from our sin and believe in him. Watch over us, we pray, in these coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. good to take something to heart with us as we leave when we worship together and I trust that you'll think about those things that you have heard as Gordon Robbins has opened the word of God this morning. Do join us again next week when I will be preaching from the 16th chapter of Acts under the heading cleansed. We're going to look at what happened to a jailer. <laughs>